Hi, everybody. Welcome to Humane Voices. I'm Carrie, and today I'm joined by co-host Marie. Marie, thanks so much for being here. Um, we have a really interesting episode today talking about undercover investigations and one particular investigation that's been going on. Marie, you want to tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Carrie, for having me on here. I'm not going to lie. I've been looking forward to co-hosting for about for months now, and I'm going to savor every minute of this, despite the difficulty of the subject matter we're talking about. So HSUS uh, recently released a 10-page report as a result of a seven-month-long investigation in an animal research facility performing toxicology tests on animals. To talk about this investigation, we have Kathleen Conley, the Humane Society of the United States' Vice President of Animal Research Issues, and live to tell us directly about her experience in the research facility, we have our investigator. Because she's an active investigator, we're going to alter her voice, not show her face, and we will be calling her investigator, which would be a very unique and fitting name in this case, but is not actually her real name. So thank you guys both for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. So maybe we can start with our investigator. Um, I mean, seven months working inside a facility that's doing animal testing just sounds emotionally incredibly difficult. And it sounds like you worked on 70 different studies from from, more, from two dozen different pharmaceutical companies. I mean, 6,000 animals. I mean, that is just huge numbers. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, your own experience and how, how that, how that is for you on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. And then maybe tell us a little bit about that experience specifically, like what kinds of animals you saw and, and what that was, what, what that was like. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, initially when I went in, um, and they, they gave me the tour, uh, the first day, um, it, it was stunning to see how many animals, uh, there are, um, you know, that particular lab, uh, tested on, uh, mice, rats, monkeys, pigs, and dogs. Um, and just to see, um, you know, the rows and rows and rows of cages of rodents and the endless rooms of, you know, dogs and pigs stuck in their cages, um, all the, you know, monkeys, um, you know, in their stainless steel cages, uh, the sounds, especially with the monkeys, um, was, was pretty alarming. Yeah. I mean, how do you, I mean, that's just a long period to be doing it too. Like, what do you do sort of at the end of the day to kind of just, you know, get your head in a better space when you have to go in the next day and do it again? Um, so normally you don't have much time, mm -hmm. uh, to do much of anything um but i um i am thankful i do have you know my animals um and so um my dogs uh were very much a stress relief mm. but they also made it a little bit harder yeah my dogs act like normal animals uh to where you know if if they're in their room and i have to let them outside they're going to run outside they're they're going to be typical dogs and run around and play um you know, the dogs there um, wagging their tails when you come up to the cage. As soon as you open the cage door, they freeze, they hit the ground. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I did when I read about your investigation was just hugged my dogs a little bit tighter that night. Um, yeah. It really, it's it's pretty sobering to imagine what you went through. Um, but do you, do you happen to know where the animals come from? I mean, particularly maybe the dogs and the primates, is there um, a place that they're getting them from? But I think Katie may be able to explain that a little bit better. Sure. Yeah. And let me say first, uh, thanks so much to our investigator for all of her hard work to reveal what's happening. I know it's emotionally taxing. So, um, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make change after this investigation. So thank you. Uh, as far as where the animals come from, uh, they are bred in facilities specifically to be used in research. Of course, this does not mean they're not capable of being loving pets in homes. They mm. are. You know, it is easy when you work in a laboratory to try to, you know, put a wall down in your head, right? So you don't think about them that yeah. way. Um, I mean, I used to work in a laboratory and I was able to compartmentalize. Um, but 
anyway, they come from breeding facilities. There is one breeding facility named Marshall Farms, which is where these dogs came from uh, that the investigator worked with. They have 20,000 animals mm. on site wow. at any one time. Wow. Uh, as far as the primates, um, they a lot of them come from overseas where they're bred. You know, they originally captured them from the wild, but they set up breeding facilities and then they sell the offspring. So those animals make those enormous journeys. A lot of them, you know, don't make the journey. Um, and then they're carted, you know, to different places in the United States. People might be familiar <clears throat> or have heard of a crash that happened in January with some monkeys that got spilled on the highway um, and escaped yeah. in a car crash. And, um, you know, several of them were, were killed. Yeah. So um, they do come from these big breeding facilities. And then uh, that's where they're tattooed and given physicals. And then so they live that life in a breeding facility and then life in stainless steel cages with no real comfort or wow. compassion. To hear these numbers at breeding facilities, I mean, to hear of 20,000 dogs at a breeding facility just blows my mind. Mm. I and mean, we, when in our work, we are talking about hundreds of numbers and how that's too much. Mm -hmm. And just the immense, like 20,000. I mean, I, I can't imagine that they have enough staff to take care of those animals, but um, that's a different subject for a different day. <laughs> um, Kathleen, I'm curious about, um, in terms of the, the dogs at the, this facility, do these, do these research facilities tend to gravitate toward particular breeds of dogs? Yes, beagles are largely used. Um, so in this case, all the tests were toxicity tests for drugs and beagles are used because of their size. They're easy to handle and not just because of their size, but because of their personalities. They're mm -hmm. very docile and can be easily manipulated. And you'll see in the videos, they are wagging their tails, even though they know someone's coming um, that may not do something, you know, may cause them harm. Uh, they're still seeking that attention. So um, they're just the animal of choice. So I know that um, investigator, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, if um, if it's ever becomes too difficult, please let me know. But um, is there anything you can share about the more upsetting things that you saw at the facility, um, the types of testing that they were doing, um, you know, the things that the dogs were experiencing day to day or any of the animals were experiencing day to day? Yeah, um, so um, I guess the dogs, um, there were multiple um, particular studies that uh, were uh, maximum tolerated dose or range finding studies, which means um, they're basically going to give them um, the most drug possible. Um, most of the time, the outcome is death, even before euthanasia. Um, there were multiple dogs that had tremors, had fevers, um, and such a high fever um, that um, a stroke was possible. Salivating, unable to walk. Um, you know, there's a current study going on right now um, that will go on through October and November. And, you know, they have a tube shoved down their throat every single day. Um, and that's what upsets me is that it, it's continuous and it's long term um, and they don't get a break from it. Um, as far as the monkeys, I saw um, pretty much the same, uh, a lot of bruising, a lot of swelling, uh, broken arms, uh, you know, knock, uh, knocked out teeth. <sighs> Are these um, animals not protected by any federal laws? I mean, it just sounds like anything goes. Is that Kathleen, maybe you can speak more to this, um, or investigator, if you have the knowledge, please let me know. Um, it just seems mind-blowing. So there is the, you know, typical testing laboratory. I mean, having the tube to put down your throat with large amounts of compound is a typical uh, procedure done in drug testing. And of course, then um, there is protection under the Animal Welfare Act. So they do have to meet minimal standards. They should be minimizing pain and distress. There's supposed to be consideration of uh, their alternatives, which can mean sometimes just reducing the number of animals used, relieving the pain and distress, but then there's replacing them. So there were definitely cases where we documented they were violating 
we believe the Animal Welfare Act, we alerted the USDA as to this and they're investigating. Um, but, you know, we don't want to forget that these, some of these tests are just how it typically is in the laboratory. Now, leaving a primate unattended so that they hang themselves in a chair. Yes, that is a violation of the Animal Welfare Act. That is not a, um, but putting them in restraint chairs for these procedures for long periods of time is a typical, um, you know, procedure. Wow. And that happened in this case because there was not enough staff, correct? Lack of staffing was definitely an issue, but I think our mm -hmm. investigator can speak to that probably better than I can. Um, as far as lack of staffing, absolutely. Um, they were always trying to hire people, um, but still, um, you know, we would work um, oftentimes an hour, two hours past uh, when we were supposed to get off. We would have to go back for blood draws um, and uh, administering um, the drug. Um, and yeah, um, as far as the monkey hanging itself, uh, the one in particular um, that I am thinking of um, was absolutely due to lack of staffing because they did not have um, someone outside watching them. They were actually in the room. So in terms of what's an actual legal violation, um, how long can a primate legally be left in a restraint like that before it is technically a violation of any kind? So you have to ask the USDA permission if you want to keep them in a chair for longer than 12 hours. 12 hours. 12 <laughs> hours. Incredible. Wow. Oh, my God. I can't even stay in my office for 12 hours. Right. Oh, yeah. my God. I mean, and I think people think those chairs that you see the primates and that's like something from, you know, the 1970s, but it, no, <laughs> this is not, not till it's not funny. Um, it is just typically used and they, I don't know if the investigator wants to share, you know, they pull the animals out of the cage by a collar. They get that collar the minute they show up at the laboratory and they basically aren't relieved of it until okay. their death. So I know one of the things you guys talked about in your report was, um, seeing you know these adverse effects reasonably quickly on some of the animals um whether it be the first or the second day of testing um what in theory would a research facility like what would they what are they supposed to do when they see that um it, are they allowed to just continue dosing the animals for the purpose of finding an answer or is there some other sort of method that they're supposed to engage at that point it should be the discussion before they even put the compound in the animal. What do we expect to see? What are we going to do if we see adverse effects? What adverse effects will trigger euthanasia? It's called a humane endpoint. Mm -hmm. So they should be doing a lot of discussion before the compound even is put into the animal. It did not seem that this was happening at this facility. Um, so that was upsetting. There should be availability of a veterinarian. And if there was something unexpected, the veterinarian should be there to relieve the animal of the suffering. And so we saw animals suffering overnight because the veterinarian can, didn't, you know, couldn't make it to the lab because of personal inconvenience. Um, so that's, you know, unacceptable. And it is a fine line. They do have the authority to make the decision, right? It's like, well, we need to you know, get the results from this test and we're going to keep dosing, but there, it, it is up to them to um, appropriately intervene. But like I said, that should be done in advance, a discussion, and everybody should be aware of what that is. And it doesn't sound like that was happening. So Kathleen, playing devil's advocate for a second here, like I assume like that after like these 20,000, these 20,000, thousands of animals are forced into this horrible, terrible conditions and all this, this testing is done. These drugs must, you know, get rushed immediately to the market to do good for humans. Is that correct? Well, I think people assume that, right? You always hear, well, it's unfortunate that we have to do this, but we need drugs for humans. And we're saying, actually, you're not getting the drugs to the humans by doing this. And it's irresponsible to continue to rely on animal tests. So it's estimated that not about 90%, and actually that's on the low end, uh, we're being conservative, uh, drugs fail ultimately in human trials and don't ever make it to market. And about half of that is due to unexpected toxicity in humans after animal tests. Mm 
Wow. So why do we continue to allow this high drug failure rate? So you don't have to choose between the dog and the human. Uh, we can have both um, if we do just change the system. And unfortunately, the system has historically relied on animals. No one ever validated whether the animals are the way to get the information. Um, mm -hmm. So now there are non-animal alternatives being developed and they're saying, well, we need to qualify these non-animal alternatives. So there's this much higher bar for those um, technologies, number one. And number two, the frustrating thing is when they want to compare it to the animal test. And when we don't, if they, if they compare to the animal test, then we're doing something wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> because the animal tests are inaccurate. Um, this so. just seems like such a no brainer to me. Like, I don't understand it because like, I mean, I think about just, you know, sort of the standard pet owner knows that chocolate, like I could eat chocolate all day long. Right. It will kill a dog. Right. And so we all know that. And yet we're, we're continuing to pursue this idea that these medicines being tested on an animal with a completely different biological system are somehow relevant to us. And I like, so what is the reason, like, given that there are alternatives available, like why aren't people embracing them more? Well, it's just historically been done, so it's easier. So you know, if you submit your dog data to FDA, they're familiar with it. They're going to move it to through the process. You have to get your non-animal method qualified. It's another step they have to take. It's going to cost time and money. You know, we've even argued this. Please just do the non-animal method alongside the animal test and get the data in front of the Food and Drug Administration. That's time and money. We're mm -hmm. not going to do that. But it's time and money wasted on the short, you know, in the long term by not advancing. So we do. It's a lot of finger pointing. You know, the companies say it's FDA's fault. FDA says it's the company's fault. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to stop the finger pointing because the animals are caught in the middle. Um, and that's our job, right, to accelerate mm -hmm. away from and get the, so there's all kinds of great technology being assessed and used, and we need to continue that development. Is there an alternative for every single animal test out there? No, there's not, uh, to be honest, but uh, we, that's the direction we should be going in. So let's invest the money in the development of additional alternatives where they don't exist. Where are the gaps? Let's focus on that. Um, so you asked me where the primates come from. There's this big, you know, concern that we don't have enough primates, you know, in the country, which is 110,000 used every year right now. Um, and let's invest more money in that. And we're saying that's the wrong direction. This is when we should be investing right. in the non-animal methods, which are ultimately going to be faster, cheaper, and give you more accurate results to develop those drugs that will save humans. And well, if I, I may, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, please continue. I was going to say, we saw the perfect example while we were in the laboratory. There was a company that was had uh, a drug in trials in humans that had already gone, undergone some animal tests. One person was hospitalized. Several others had liver injury. They stopped pursuit of that drug. That very same drug was undergoing additional animal tests that the investigator was working on. Wow. Absolutely. So, I mean, they stopped pursuit of that drug but that is, was a perfect example. And so um, they are looking back at drugs that failed like that. Some of the non-animal method developers, uh, they did a paper showing that these, um, they called organ on a chip technology. So people might not understand what we mean by alternatives, but where they take human cells and they create an environment like it is in the human body and test the toxicity. And 87% of the time it accurately predicted, we would have known the toxicity in humans before they failed in the humans. So an 87% success rate or a 97, 90% failure rate. So it seems pretty clear what direction we should be going in. So Kathleen, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm not gonna lie, organ chip sort of just <laughs> sounds to me like a really disgusting hors d'oeuvre. Um, you know, so I- funny, people I, say that. I, I never ever thought I, of it that way, but yes. Uh, well, maybe, maybe it's just because I love chips. I mean, <laughs> I, I quite literally survive off of potatoes most yeah, of the time. But day. not organ so, chips, Marie, no, not, not no, organ No, not chips. organ <laughs> chips, believe me, absolutely. Um, I'll just keep my potato chips. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes I usually have them stored underneath my desk, but, um, but uh, thank you for explaining that. But I also wanted to ask you, um, we also here are not just talking about, we're, we're talking about toxicity tests, right? So this is one, we know that toxicity tests on animals are not necessarily determinative of, when it, of whether or not it will be toxic on humans. But in addition to that, to what extent is efficacy considered in this, um, in this conversation? Is, are, does a pharmaceutical company need to prove that 
these drugs or these substances are somewhat effective before they get tested on animals? Is that something that happens after the fact? Um, or are we just basically, you know, testing animals to toxic toxic levels before we even know whether or not this drug is going to do anything for humans? Right, throwing so there, spaghetti at a wall, basically. Yeah. Yeah, there is efficacy testing in animals. You can do it without animals. The great news there is there's a company named Hesperus, which submitted data to FDA completely non-animal um, for a drug for a rare disease efficacy because they don't have an animal model for that disease. And it got approved and is going through the process. So we're really excited that this is kind of a new frontier. So maybe we could talk a little bit more with the investigator. Um, I, I'm really just curious about what this experience is like long term for you being undercover at the lab. Like not only, you know, just how you're able to deal with the day, but, you know, being there that long, you know, I, I mean, when you start a new job, you start making friends, you start you're sort of learning the ropes and just, you know, like what's that experience like? Do you end up getting to know coworkers? What's your impression of the folks kind of doing this work? Because I think it's very, it, it can be easy to sort of villainize folks and and I'm curious about what the attitudes of the workers in the labs are about these animals. Uh yeah, absolutely. Um as with any job like you said, you're going to make friends. Um just because I am an under, an undercover investigator doesn't mean I'm not, you know, human. Mm. Um and you know, a lot of the the lab animal techs um you know that were my coworkers uh were friendly. Mm. Um you know, they, I, I got along with them. Um, and, you know, they would ask me about my pets. They would ask about my day. They would show me uh, videos of, you know, their dogs at home, um, which was, you know, odd to me. Um, but I think that also goes to their mindset and that they kind of, you know, rationalize what they're doing but also, you know, this is in a very small town in Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had been told that there was nowhere else that they could work with animals and make the kind of money that they made there. A lot of them came from, you know, vet tech backgrounds, working at a vet clinic. Uh, there was one girl that actually worked at the Humane Society uh, in the oh, wow. neighboring county. Um, so I think it's just, you know, they're stuck in in small town with no way out. I know that, like, are these facilities inspected? Are they, um, are there inspection reports that exist out there that could be um, brought up through a Freedom of Information Request Act? I mean, Freedom of Information Act request. <laughs> yeah, so the US Department of Agriculture is supposed to inspect facilities every year, but we learned uh, that, the internal communications within the agency were that they were not going to be doing full inspections every year. Instead, if they were accredited, if the facility was accredited by ALAC, the Association for the Assessment and Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care, which is a private accrediting body, um, if they were accredited by ALAC, they would not need to get the full inspection. So the USDA inspector could technically go in and never even see an animal, just relying on that ALAC accreditation. And this wow. facility was ALAC accredited. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there have been studies that have shown that ALAC accredited facilities tend to have higher numbers of animal welfare act violations. So oh. we're trying to get the agency to change um, that procedure. So Kathleen, um, barring, you know, going undercover at a lab or doing the kind of work that you're doing day to day, like what can the sort of average citizen who's concerned about this do to sort of see it come to a conclusion? I mean, I I, I really was struck walk, watching some of the investigations footage, I think, you know, by something you said earlier and that some of it just seems like it's from another era and yet it's right now, right? I mean, and so how can we make sure that it does become something of another era? I know we're sending people to space, but it's like, yeah, you know, they're riding a horse and buggy. It's just um, so antiquated. Uh, but the average person, and I do want to say that is the key is getting the public involved, because if the public doesn't speak up, they're just going to continue what they're doing. Um, so we've seen time and again, people weighing in does make change. I'm not saying every single time we ask for something, it happens, but it does create a groundswell. You know, the first thing they can do is follow the Facebook page of my department. Mm -hmm. So it's facebook.com slash HSUS animal testing. Mm -hmm. And that is every time we want people to take action, it is right there. And we're communicating 
also the good scientific advancements that are happening and how the replacements um, are looking um, to be superior consistently. I think, you know, people want to be assured, you know, I understand we all have family members we want to get you know, medications that are effective and safe. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what my advice would be is to follow our Facebook page for any kind of um, updates and please do take action and share with your friends. I think people, you know, we get people reaching out and saying, I heard they're using dogs in this laboratory and isn't that illegal? I think people don't understand that it still happens. So it's our job to remind them. And is there anything that we can do specifically to help the animals at this particular facility? Is there anything you're asking consumers to do um, for, for the ones that we know that are still there? Yeah, and I'm glad you've asked that. So we do have an ask out and the company is Innative where we did the investigation. The pharmaceutical companies pay Innative to do the animal tests for them. And in this case, Crinetics, uh, the investigator brought up some puppies being dosed for several months. Um, there were 80 dogs being used in toxicity tests like this that were calling for them to be released. Uh, so we're calling on the company. There's an action alert on our website. 273,000 people last time I looked had already signed this petition. People are calling and uh, we're trying to get people to, you know, at the companies to commit to releasing those animals. So we have that. But we also now have an alert on our website to ask the Food and Drug Administration to make changes change policies, invest more in the alternatives and incentivize the use of these alternatives. You know, if the companies aren't, don't have incentives to do it, they're not going to. So just calling for change at the government level as well. So the private and the government. Great. Those are definitely things that I would want to look into. Um, investigator, I, I did have one more question for you, which was, um, is there anything positive that you wanted to share about some of the animals that you met during your experience? Um, you know, I, I want to try and leave our listeners off on a good note, but I also think it's great for us to remember these, these, you know, sentient beings in a positive light. Um, was there any particular animals who touched you, who you'd like to, you know, give an homage to them, I guess? Yeah. Um, I didn't like naming them and this sounds, um, weird, I guess. Um, but I didn't want any one of them to think that I loved them any more or any less because I loved them all. Um, but there were two monkeys um, uh, in a longer term study that were there. Um, it was a male and a female. Uh, the male, his face like reminded me of an old man, uh, but he was so intelligent and um, he was very inquisitive. He liked to um, you know, play with our pens. If we had anything in our hands, um, he wanted to play with it. Um, if you um, if you saw the uh, uh, restraint poles that would have to be used to move them, um, he would play with those. Um, he'd flip and hang from all of them. And um, he was very sweet, uh, very emotional. Uh, and the female, the female was just goofy. She was... <laughs> She was, she was very sensitive. Uh, again, she was real friendly, real sweet. She liked to hold my hands, pet my hands. Um, she would try to nibble on my gloves. Um, yeah, those two, those two were pretty special. I think most people think of, you know, wild monkeys and, and, you know, being crazy and aggressive and, um, they, these monkeys proved otherwise. That's very special. Sincerely, thank you so much for sharing that. I think um, that gives us even more reason to want to move forward on this and to do the best work we can to change this practice, these practices. Yeah, and I think you got some really sort of touching um, footage of those monkeys that people can see um, on our on our website. Um, it's when when I watched it, it's pretty devastating. Yeah, it was for sure. So the monkeys, the way that they sort of spend their days, are they just sort of, do they get any enrichment at all? I mean, how are they sort of treated? How do they spend the sort of time that they're there? Um, so the monkeys, um, as Kathleen um, alluded to earlier, uh, the day that they come in, they're fitted with collars um, and they're hard plastic collars um, and they won't, uh, they won't have those taken off until, um, they are tranquilized uh, for necropsy. Um, so they live with those 24 hours a day, seven days a week, pretty much their entire life. Uh, they are in 
dark stainless steel cages, um, pretty solitary. The only time that they're let out, um, they are actually put in those restraint chairs. Um, so it's either, you know, a stainless steel cage or a chair where, you know, your neck is confined and, and you can't move. Um, and uh, they will have, sometimes they had uh, mirrors on their cages for quote enrichment. Um, they may have like a set of plastic keys for a toy. Um, but I think what, um, what was uh, not concerning, but just a little different for me is that uh, they had two TVs in each room for the monkeys to watch television, um, which they didn't usually care. Um, but a lot of times the, uh, uh, the text would put on Curious George. Oh, wow. For the monkeys to watch, which uh, is ironic. Yeah. Uh, Curious George is free and happy and walking around. God. I mean, I think I would have just gotten distracted being a worker there wanting to watch Curious George with along with my fellow monkeys but yeah I would have preferred to watch Curious George than what was actually going on around me that's for sure uh, right oh. exactly 100 percent out of curiosity did the monkeys ever use the mirrors to see who's coming because when I worked in the lab and they were given mirrors they would turn the mirror so they could see who was coming in the door and what oh. was happening some of them would um but most of the time I mean you know, monkeys are intelligent, intelligent creatures. Um, and, you know, to give them a, a baby toy to play with for enrichment is disgusting. Provides no stimulation. So I wanted to ask you guys about what your favorite chip was, um, given that we already established that we don't like organ chips, but, or we do like organ chips for research purposes. Oh, we like organ it, chips, yes. Yeah, exactly, them, exactly. Them. But I, I do have a different question for you, um, which is if if we were, and we've been asking this of, of a lot of our uh, podcast guests recently, um, if Hollywood were to make a movie about your story, um, and I guess I'd like the answer from both of you, Investigator and Kathleen, um, who would you like to play that movie version of you? <laughs> um so i think it would be george clooney Ooh. <laughs> only because um so if you if you look him up he had um he was in love with his pet pigs Ooh. and i love pigs i i think they're they're awesome awesome animals yeah that pig used to sleep in bed with him actually I can't, I can't remember what his first pig's name was, but they he adopted it with a former girlfriend. And then, you know, when it was so a so-called teacup pig, and then it grew to be like 300 pounds <laughs> and it was still sleeping in the bed with him. Yeah. Did you guys see the um, the Nick Cage movie recently? Yes. Pig? Oh. Yes. That's very incredible. difficult, but very good movie. Very incredible and movie, yeah. also about someone who loves their pig. Yes. <laughs> what was this movie? Pig. It's called Pig. Pig. It's oh, okay. You should see oh, it. All right. It's really good. I'll put it on my list as soon as we get off this podcast. So, Kathleen, what about you? Oh, I am not good at these kinds of questions, I'll be honest. Uh, maybe Helen Hunt. That mm. is a clear, that that is exactly who I would have said. I think that's perfect. I love her. We haven't had yeah. Helen Hunt lately. <laughs> And she actually played in a movie about chimpanzees going to space. I don't know if you remember that. Which was yeah. that? I don't remember it. Oh, gosh, now I, of course you, of course I brought it up and now I can't remember the name of it. Uh, I, I do that all the time. Project X? With Matthew, yeah, Matthew Broderick. Oh. I had forgotten she was in that. I always yeah. think of that as a Broderick movie and completely forgot that Helen Hunt was in it. Yes. All right, so when we get off this call, I'm going to call George Clooney and Helen Hunt. And um, we'll see if we can get them not contracted down, you know? Yeah, I'm sure Just they have nothing sure on their can, plates. Yeah. Make sure she can throw out a lot of acronyms like I've done today. Ooh, so we love the acronyms. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today for this episode of Humane Voices. Kathleen, our secret investigator, thank you so much for your time and especially for your long, long period of time undercover. We really hope that this will do some good for the animals. Um, I know it was tough and... Um, Again, if people want to get involved, um, please check out the Animal Research Issues page on Facebook and follow our work at humanesociety.org. We'll see you next time on Humane Voices. Humane Voices.